This morning, we're going to continue our series on the Lord's Prayer. Well, I'm going to briefly do a a recap, um, and then we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, focusing in on verse 9. So let me pray for our time as we get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, and God, this time we could gather into this beautiful building that you've given to us. God, I pray that As we hear these words, these words that your son teaches us on how to pray, God, that we would soak them in. God, that we would eat them up. God, that you would infiltrate our hearts and our minds. God, those places that can be very difficult and very hard. God, help us soften those spots up to hear what you have to say. Lord, I pray as we listen, those things that distract us, the things that we bring in, God, they would fade away. God, that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and minds. In Christ's name, amen. If you were here last week, hopefully you do remember that we started a series on what's called the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that revolutionized the world. It's the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray in Luke chapter 11. They actually come to him and say, Jesus, they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And in Matthew chapter 6, where we're going to be at today, the kind of the correlating passage, Jesus is teaching it on what's called the Sermon on the mountain. Last week we started with this, that prayer, more than anything else, exposes what we truly believe about God. More than how we act, more than what we say, prayer has that kind of that direct correlation with what we believe. Not just about God, but about ourselves and about others. And like I said last week, I think that's why many times we don't want to pray out loud. Something might be said, maybe it's not even unbiblical, just a little bit off, and we don't want to be exposed, so we're a little bit shy to pray out loud. I remember telling the story last week, that happened to me. I was praying, and my senior pastor, I'd been a Christian for less than a year, corrected my prayer at the church I was at. Now, he was not trying to be rude. He was a teaching moment, right? And yet we see Jesus say these words, when you pray. Not if you pray, not when you might possibly pray, but when you pray. And so there's this expectation. In fact, prayer in the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ, they go hand in hand. You cannot separate prayer at all. In fact, prayer needs to be a regular routine that Christians, that believers, not only should do, but need to do because that's our direct line, our direct communication with the God of this universe. And yet at the same time, Jesus starts this teaching with the watch out. We looked at that last week. We started with the the do not do's when it comes to prayer. We saw that when we enter into prayer with our hearts, we need to not be lackadaisical, or a more churchy word might be, don't be lukewarm. In other words, when you go into prayer, make sure your heart is in it. Jesus, in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 6, says this. He says, do not be like the hypocrites. Those were the religious leaders. They were the ones who would pray on the street corners, and they'd puff up their chest and look all nice and, nice and good, and they'd stand in the synagogues, and they'd have these awesome prayers that people would hear, but their hope was that people would see them and not focus on God himself. They forgot that this prayer that we do is supposed to be an intimate time that we have just one-on-one with the Lord. They were hoping people would see their, quote, holiness, unquote, and see how good they were. When we enter into prayer, that's what we need to be focused on. We need to remember not to be the hypocrite. I said these words last week from Charles Spurgeon. I love this quote. He says, to pray is to enter the treasure house of God and to gather riches out of an inexhaustible storehouse. That's an awesome, that's an awesome quote, friends. That should give us chills. That should give us encouragement. That should give us hope that when we enter in, we're going before Lord and that inexhaustible storehouse is God himself. That is what we are gathering up, that peace, that rest, that, 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 that presence of the Lord. And so we must be careful to check our hearts and our attitudes before we actually enter into prayer. But Jesus doesn't stop there. We read this in verses seven and eight. It says, and when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. 
for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. The right kind of prayer does not use vain repetition, which is any and all prayer, which is mostly words and no meaning. In other words, it's all lips. It's giving lip service to the Lord. There's no heart. There's no mind in it. And friends, I've, I've run in those circles before. I grew up Catholic. Now, this is not a diss on Catholicism, but I went through a thing called CCD, and I have no idea what that acronym means, but I remember going through it. And I remember learning something called the rosary. And a rosary is a necklace you put on. It has these little beads. And each one of the beads is a prayer that you would do. And it's very, very repetitive. Now, I'm not saying that your heart cannot be in that. But be careful that it's just not the same thing over and over and over and over again. Thinking that God will hear me if I just use a lot of the same words. Now, many times, friends, hear hear me. All we have is God help. We're in a desperate moment. God help. God help. And that's all we can think of. That is okay because our hearts and minds are in that prayer. But if it's just empty phrases, we're not actually connecting with God. We have to be careful of that. When I was in high school, I had a a great English teacher, and I've told you about her before. Her name was Miss Cook. And on one hand, she was awesome. She cared about us. On the other hand, she was the most annoying teacher I ever had in my high school career. But in her class, whenever we wrote papers, there was no word limits. So most teachers, they give you like specifics, these rules that you had to stick with. Remember, if you go back, think about school, you had to have a specific font. And back when I was in school, it was Times New Roman, and it had to be a specific size. It had to be size 12, so you couldn't have like a font that was really long, right, and really big, so it made up all the paper, so you didn't have to write very much. It was like specific rules, but Miss Cook... She didn't have those rules. I remember vividly her saying this. If you can say something in five words instead of ten, say it in five. And I can tell you this, friends. After I took her advice and I narrowed my paper down, I still got a bad grade. I'm a terrible writer. And I learned that back then. I'm okay with it, right? But the thing is this, is that when we have a narrow focus, it helps us Go to what we need to say. Just like writing a term paper in college, if you have this wide focus, it's going to be really difficult, but if you narrow it down, it's actually easier to write. Now, does this mean that our prayers should not be long? And the answer is absolutely not. There are many people who have long, drawn-out prayers, and they're absolutely beautiful. Remember, it's a heart thing. It's a mind thing. Are we just going through the motion saying, oh, I'll check that box off again. I pray today. I'll check that box off again. I did this today. No, is it our hearts? What's our attitudes? What's our focus? I think another question we have to ask is what's our motivation? Is it all about us? As we're going to see here today, where do we start Is it with our wants, our desires, our needs? In other words, is it me focused or is it God's focus? I mean, Jesus already says that that God already knows what you're going to ask before you even ask it. God knows our needs before we even go to him. In fact, God knows the needs that we don't even know we need. I think that makes sense. God knows us better than anyone else. And so I see Jesus, when he starts this prayer, teaching his disciples I see, that, I see him as saying, guys, come as you are. Don't try to hide. Come as you are. God already knows where you're at. Your, your, your long, repetitive words aren't going to get his attention. Thinking that you're holier than anybody else isn't going to get his attention, that you're better than anybody else isn't going to get his attention. God knows and sees what you need exactly where you're at. And that's why we, when we pray, we need to enter in ready to commune with God. And that's where Jesus starts this prayer. Look at verse 9. It says this, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're going to stick on that one verse today. I'm going to break this into some really small chunks. And the reason I want to break this into some small chunks is because many times I know that I can waste words, but Jesus never does. 
There's a reason he says these words in this order right at the beginning of this prayer. There's a reason God is going to be focusing in right on, or pardon me, Jesus is going to be focusing right on God. And so he starts with our Father, we'll look at that. In heaven, we're going to look at that. The word hallowed, and finally your name. And to be honest with you, friends, I'm going to throw a lot of theology at you. And the reason I'm going to throw a lot of theology at you is because if we don't understand that, we can't understand the application which we are supposed to take away this morning. Jesus is going to do what he does best. He's going to glorify his God right at the start of this prayer. And so he starts with this, our Father. Anybody ever ask the question, why doesn't Jesus say my Father? He'd be justified in doing it, right? He could have. In fact, there's other times that he says the words, my father, not our father. Look at John chapter 10, verses 23 through 30. States this. Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon, uh, Solomon, which is kind of the outside of the temple. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, for no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. Again, in verse 29, my Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So Jesus is in essence saying this. You have God the Father, and then there's me, God the Son. I could say, my Father in heaven, if I wanted to, but he doesn't. In fact, he doesn't use the first person at all. There's no I or me. It's always us or our. We need to remember that Jesus, he's teaching his disciples, and he's teaching them in this very first word that they are part of something bigger. He's teaching them that they will soon be part of what is called the church, the group of people that make up Christ followers, the children of God himself. Our Father. Back in those days, you would rarely hear a self-respecting Jew call God Father. And you would never hear a self-respecting Jewish person Say the word that Jesus used to describe the Father. In the Greek, it's Abba. We translate that the closest we can as Daddy. Never, ever would have happened. But what Jesus is showing us is the intimacy that we have with God. If you have had children or you have children, think back to when they're little. Just two, three, four, five years old, they're learning language. What's one of your favorite words? Mommy. Daddy, right? How good is it when they come up and say mommy or daddy to you? I know some of you are getting sentimental. I understand. I am too. But it's such a good feeling because that's a term of affection and trust. It's a term that a child gives to a parent when there's, there's no fear present. It's a term that a child gives to a present or to a parent when the child knows that that parent will, will provide for them. That is what Jesus is teaching us about God when he uses that word. Even the Jewish people knew that God was a father. Look at Malachi chapter 2 verse 10. Plainly states this. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? The issue is this, is that over the course of time, this had been lost. We've, we've looked at this before. I don't blame them for losing this. Over the course of hundreds upon hundreds of years, these Jewish rabbis, these Jewish leaders, they desired holiness. How do we consecrate ourselves like God tells us in the Old Testament? How do we separate ourselves for God so that we can be better for him? What do they do? The easiest thing we can do. Let's go to the works, the do's, the don'ts. And what happened was this, is that over and over toward the course of time, God became more and more and more of the great judge, which he is, but less of the dad. 
that is in part what makes God so great. Yes, he has authority to be the judge, and he is the judge. But he also, because of his nature, because of his character, he's able to show insurmountable amounts of grace to us. Because of his character, he's able to show insurmountable amounts of mercy and love. And he's not just the judge, he's also the dad to us. That is the father in which we pray to. And I I love this, friends. What that shows as well is that God's desire is that we would come and we would commune with him. If we have the idea that he's just the great judge, just the mean guy in the sky ready to throw that lightning bolt down on us, are we going to want to pray to him? Are we going to want to go to him? Absolutely not. Why? There's fear. There's going to be fear in our lives that we might say something wrong even to God, and then all of a sudden we get in trouble. But no, he's not just that. He is dad, and he wants his children to come in and share with him and commune with him. I love it when my kids come and they share their day. My daughter, she talk, 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 right? All the time, and I get it, I love it, it's great. She's sharing her day, and half the time I'm not following the story at all, but I really don't care. She's still just talking to me. My little boy, he's kind of different. I'm like, Matthew, how's your day? He's like, good, what'd you learn? I don't know. Did you go to school? I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty confident I dropped you off this morning, buddy. But isn't it great when your kids come and they bring the good things in life and the sorrows in life and you can just love on them? It's the same thing with God. His desire is that we would come in. Those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ have been made new and have been adopted into God's family. Therefore, what? He's our father. He's our father. He's our dad. So what do we do? We come into that throne with throne room, we come with reverence, we come with boldness, knowing that he is a father who cares. Not the mean guy in the sky, not the one who's going to say, well, you did this, 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 and this wrong today. Don't do it again. Yeah, there's conviction, and that should come. But he's also the one who loves us enough to convict us, to guide us, to shepherd us. He's a father who cares. Then Jesus says this, that it's our Father in heaven. The word in heaven points to the majesty of God and his transcend, the, transcendent, the transcendency of his nature. He is the God who was on high. He is before all created things. Deuteronomy 33 says this, There is no one like God, O Joshurin, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. Psalm 97 verse 9 says, for you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. And then Ecclesiastes, we see this. Solomon. He gives a warning for when people come into the temple, but we can apply this to prayer. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 and 2, it says this, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. And Solomon's literally talking about the house of God because he built it. He says, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Same thing when we go into prayer, just going through the motions, going in lukewarm. Verse 2, he continues, it says, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. Why? For God is in heaven, and you, we, are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Jesus is reminding his disciples, he's reminding us again who God is. Who can know the ways of God? No one. Who can know the mind of God? No one. Why? Because he is far and lifted up, high above everything, including us. Your Father is in heaven. You are on earth. Remember that. Jesus then uses the word hallowed. Our Father in heaven, hallowed. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed isn't a word we use too often anymore, is it? Pretty confident. I went all last year without using that word, and I was just fine. Kind of like all the math I didn't learn in high school, right? Hallowed, though. Closest thing we might have is Halloween. It's coming up. 
The two don't correlate very well. Simply put, the word hallowed means to make holy. And in this context, what Jesus is saying is this. Make your name holy. Our Father in heaven, make holy your name. What Jesus is saying is, God, glorify your character here. God, glorify your plan. Glorify your will. See, when Jesus says, hallowed be your name, he's not just saying, make the name God holy. No, he's encompassing everything about God himself. Make everything that you are God, make it holy. God, everything that you are, glorify yourself. And I think this is something that we've missed in the church, and we began to miss it many, many years ago. I've been a believer for 24 years now. It's not a long time. I didn't grow up in the church. I became a believer when I was 16. But something I think we've begun to miss is this. We've forgotten the character of God. We've forgotten the nature of God. That's a problem, friends. I don't find it coincidental that Jesus starts this prayer by focusing no less than four times on the greatness of God. Our Father focuses God in heaven, focuses God hallowed, focuses God. Your name, focus is God. These all point to the very character and the very nature of who God is. And when we forget that, when we forget who God is and his greatness, what happens? We bring him down. The church brings him down. We take him off of that pedestal where he does belong and we bring him down to something that we can maybe understand a bit better and yet that is not God. If I can understand him, He's not God at all. He is supposed to be on high. When we bring him down, we forget how good and great and powerful and awesome he is. He becomes less and less and less important. I see this as the foundational issue with the struggle that the American church is having right now. We've forgotten the majesty of God. That's why theology and doctrine is so important. What Jesus is doing right here, he's saying before anything else, focus on God. When you pray, start with focusing on God. But not only that, I'm going to end here. When he says, hallowed be your name, make holy your name, he's also saying this, make your name known. How does God make holy his name? We see it in creation. Creation declares the glory of the Lord. We see it in miracles. I believe those are still around. We see God declaring who he is, making himself glorified in many different ways, but the biggest way is this, friends, it's you and me. How does God make his name known? How does he hallowed be his name? He does it through you and me, by living a life that's obedient to him, by showing his love to people that really many times are hard to love, by shining his light in our everyday lives. That is how God makes himself known in this world. The best way is through his bride, through his church, that we shine so bright that people ask, what do you have? Because I want it. What are you doing? Because I want to be involved. I want this thing that gives you joy. I want this thing that gives you life. My life isn't going so well, and I'm kind of lost. What gives you purpose? And we can say, you know what? It's Jesus. That's how we hallowed be his name. That's how we make him known. We love the lost person. We love our neighbor just like we love ourselves. And that is our calling, friends. To love others. How do we glorify our God in heaven? We live for him. How do we make him known? We live for him. 
Love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen? Let me pray. Lord God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for this prayer, Lord. God, I pray that as we go through this series that you would speak. God, so often we've learned this prayer when we are young and it's just words. I pray that it become much more than that, Lord. I pray that it would become an anthem, a rallying cry. God, something that we would be able to focus on in our prayer lives and live for in our daily lives. A God who is great, a God who is awesome, a God who wants to be glorified in us to show the world his love and his grace and his mercy, to show the world that there is truth out there that can set them free from their sin. God, a God that wants and desires that none should perish, but that all should reach eternal life. God, use us. In Christ's name, amen.